This is another video in the series for Math 1133 for UTSA. Today we're talking about Chapter 13, Integral Calculus. And uh, as expected, we're starting with Section 1, which is antiderivatives. So we're going to start with by talking about, a little bit about arithmetic, just to give you the concept of what's going on with antiderivatives in the, in the simplest terms before we get to, you know, the, the broader terms. So when you're in, say, like, fourth grade, fifth, no, fourth grade, when you're four or five years old or six, I meant like pre-K or kindergarten or whatever, and you're learning addition, subtraction, stuff like that. So you'll learn things like two plus three equals five by counting, counting on your hands, or maybe you have like manipulatives or something, right? Like little plastic blocks. So you learn that, you memorize it, and then later you learn about subtraction. So you learn about five minus three. And so the way it's typically explained is something like, okay, what do you add with three to get five, right? Something plus three makes five. And because you've memorized your addition tables, you just think, oh, uh, two plus three is five. So the answer is two, and that's correct. Five minus three is two. And it's because you're, you're thinking about addition backwards. So then you learn multiplication. Two times three is six, right? And you do that through, through blocks and counting, right? And then after that, division, right? Six divided by three. And the way you solve that is something times three equals six, right? Because you've memorized it. Oh, two times three, that's six, which is you know, correct. Six divided by three, or rather, six divided by three is two, right? Okay. So that's basically how it goes, right? You're, you're thinking backwards through something you've done. So now that we've done derivatives pretty thoroughly, we've done, you know, all the different types of differentiation steps, product rule, sum rule, difference rule, chain rule, stuff like that. We can now talk about antiderivatives, thinking backwards through a derivative. So let's say I had f of x equals 8. And I want to know, what would you start with and find the derivative to get 8? So I want to say, okay, there's something, you find the derivative and you get 8 as a result. Okay. In an in-person class, I would just say, you know, what do you, what do you guys think? What do we think? And pretty quickly, someone would go, oh, uh, 8x, which, which is correct. That's, that is an antiderivative of 8, right? If you start with 8x, you find the derivative, you get 8, right? Um, and so we can say that like big F, capital F of x equals 8x. That is uh, an antiderivative. Now I say an antiderivative because really there's more than one. I could have said 8x plus 1 or plus 10, or whatever, because the derivative of a number is 0. So the derivative of 8x plus 10 is 8 plus 0, which is still, of course, just 8, right? So really, I could say, um, and let's call that, um, let's call that f1. f2, and, and I'll make sure that this is very obviously a capital F, f2 of x. Well, this could be 8x plus, plus 10. And so this is sometimes called a um, specific solution, or sorry, rather a specific antiderivative or a um, particular antiderivative. So I'll call it specific antiderivative. Okay. Um, more broadly, and I'll call this F3 just because I don't want to use capital F for three different things. I could say 8x plus C. C for some constant number. This is called the general antiderivative. Okay. So when I say that 8x is an antiderivative, that's because there's lots of them. There's infinitely many. 8x plus something is the general antiderivative. Okay. Which is basically what I say here. So given functions little f and big f, so little f and big f, capital in other words, if f, if big f prime of x equals little f of x for all x in the domain of little f, okay, then big f is called an antiderivative of little f. This is really what we were talking about up here, just written as a definition rather than in examples. Okay, and notation. This um, notation here might not mean a whole lot yet. We're going to give it some context later. And this you might notice, oh, this is um, this is like dx as in uh, 
the derivative, which it's related, but we'll get more detail on that later. It might not make a whole lot of sense yet. What I want you to, for now, think of this as um, a container. This sort of stretched S looking thing means, okay, we're, we're the up next is the function for which we're finding an antiderivative. And then this DX means that thing we just said, that's the thing that we're finding the antiderivative of. In other words, think of these as, but the term is bookends. They are the they're the two on a bookshelf. They're the two things that hold up the books in the middle, right? Okay, so so this refers to the general antiderivative. This this notation means okay, we're we're going to find the general antiderivative. All right. So examples. So the antiderivative, and I I could say an antider antiderivative or the antiderivative depending on the context. So the antiderivative of seven dx. Well, much like with 8, this is just going to be 7x, and then plus c if I want the general one, which is typically what we'll do. Sometimes we won't bother with the plus c. That depends, um, and we'll, we'll get that at a later time. How about 0? Well, that's going to be uh, c, some number. The derivative of some number right, is going to be 0. So the antiderivative of 0 is some number. How about 2x? This one might be a little bit harder. Or maybe you should pause the video and think about it for a minute. What do I start with and find the derivative to get 2x? Well, that would be x squared. x squared, the derivative of x squared is 2x. So x squared is a specific antiderivative. So to get the general one, I'll add plus c to get the general antiderivative of 2x. How about x squared? Again, this one's maybe a little bit harder. So think, what do I start with and find the derivative to get x squared? And maybe this is straightforward. I'm sure some people watching the video will right away have the right answer and others not so much. Um, you might think about x cubed, right? But x cubed is not x, uh, rather the derivative of x cubed is not x squared. It's 3x squared. So if I divide both sides of this equation by 3, or in other words, multiply, let's do it this way, multiply by 1 third on both sides, right? Then we get cancellation on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, this can move inside. And I should probably write that more neatly. Inside the brackets. So the derivative of 1 third x cubed is x squared. Oops, cubed plus c, okay? And you might notice um, that, that this exponent increased by 1 when you do the antiderivative, and there's a pattern to that, which we'll talk about pretty soon. How about this one? What would you start with and find the derivative to get x to the 7? And again, probably you should pause the video, think about it a little bit, and you, I'm sure you can, most people will be able to figure this out relatively quickly. So of course, the exponent is going to have to be 8, right? So that when you do the power rule, you subtract 1 from the exponent, it becomes a 7. But in the power rule for the derivative, you also multiply that exponent in front before you reduce. So you're going to multiply by 8 in front in the process of moving over. But there's no 8 there. There's really a, a 1, an implied 1 coefficient. So what should we put here to compensate? Well, if we look up here... 1 over 3 because of the, the exponent, so we'll do 1 over 8. And if you find the derivative of 1 8 x to the 8th power, you get x to the 7th. So 1 8, 1 8 x to the 8th power plus c is the general antiderivative. What's the pattern here? Well, how much room do I have? Yeah, I got a bit of room. Okay, so what's the pattern? So um, the power rule for the derivative Power rule for differentiation, let's call it that. Differentiate. Okay. Step one, you multiply the exponent in front. Right? Step two, subtract one from the exponent. Right? So what I want you to think about is, um, if you're wearing, if you if you wear, well, okay, so when you wear shoes, you often wear socks. Not always, sometimes you wear sandals or something, right? Hopefully you don't wear sandals with socks, right? Um, 
So if, if you put your socks on first, and you put your shoes on second, right? That would be normal. What comes off first? Can you take off your socks first? If you're reversing the process, well, no, the, the shoes have to come off first, right? Unless you're extremely talented and somehow you get the socks off first, that would be amazing. You, you don't do that. So socks on, shoes on, and then later shoes off, socks off. You have to re reverse the steps in reverse order. So for the power rule for anti-differentiation, anti-differentiation, well, that almost worked really well. Right. Step one is you add one to the exponent, right? I'm undoing this, okay? Then I'm going to undo what's normally the first step. You would normally multiply the exponent in front, so we're going to divide the exponent in front. And that's it, okay? So basically, well, basically every differentiation rule sum rule, difference rule, product rule, chain rule, all those, they have um, a way of reversing them to get an anti-differentiation rule. The power rule is relatively simple, which is why we're talking about this one now. So let's look at the different properties. So the power rule we just talked about. So uh, the antiderivative of x to the n, well, we just said, well, you increase, it, increase the exponent by one and then divide the exponent in front. There's more than one way to write this. Um, I'm gonna say that this is one, over n plus one, one more than the exponent, times x to the n plus one power uh, plus c. This can also be written as a x n plus one over n plus one. That's the same thing. How about a constant? Well, the, the derivative of any linear function will just be its uh, slope, right? If you have the derivative of mx plus b, this derivative is just m. So, Basically, since the derivative of a linear function is a number, the antiderivative of a number is a linear function. This would be kx plus c. Okay. The constant multiple, which is, um, I, I guess it's a way of referring or reversing um, the constant multiple rule for the derivative, but it looks very similar. Basically, if you have a multiplier in an antiderivative next to some function, k can just sit out in front. And, and this is analogous to the constant multiple rule for the derivative. But the reciprocal rule. This is something that has an analog, which we'll talk about um, in a moment. Well, if you remember, okay, what, what do you start with and find the derivative to get one over x? Well, it'd be ln of x, right? And plus c, but let's worry about that in a moment. Um, not yet, right? The derivative of ln of x is one over x, right? D, dx, ln of x is 1 over x. That's old news. Well, maybe. So if you look at this graph on the right, where y equals ln of x, and look at the point where x equals 2, right there. The slope is about 1 half. Well, rather, the slope is exactly 1 half, but I'll approximate that by sketching that little line there. Okay. If you look at the graph over on the left, at x equals 2, the y-coordinate is one half. Okay, so this graph on the left gives the slope of the graph on the right. And if we look at on the left, right here at x equals negative two, the slope is a lot like this one, but the graph is curved down. So the slope is negative one half, which I will sketch and get kind of approximately close. Not going to be perfect. The auto snap tool wants to help. Fine, close enough. It's, it's, it wants to line up with the other line and they're both not perfect, so whatever. Over here, at y equals negative two, or rather x equals negative two, we have a y coordinate of negative one half. So the graph on the left, the y coordinates are the slopes of the points on the graph on the right, okay? So the derivative of this graph is this graph, which means the antiderivative of this graph is that graph over there on the right. And the domain of this graph on the left includes negative values, which is why we need this section, okay? So that's why the absolute value is essential for the antiderivative, because if you say, oh, 
that this is just ln of x, well then what if x is negative 1? The natural logarithm is not defined for negative 1, for x equals negative 1. So we need the absolute value bars there to accommodate this chunk of the domain. Okay, And of course, plus c. All right, what's next? Okay, exponential function. So uh, the anti antiderivative of e to the x, well, if you start with something and find the derivative and get e to the x, what would that be? What would you start with and find the derivative to get e to the x? So as before, you should probably pause the video and think about it. Most people most people probably figure this out without, without too much trouble. Well, that's e to the x. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So that's basically it. So e to the x plus c is the antiderivative of e to the x. Okay, how about the sum rule? If you have an antiderivative of some function of x plus some other function of x, so u and v are assumed to be functions of x, well, you just do them separately. Antiderivative of u dx plus antiderivative of v dx. And just handle them separately. We'll do examples in a minute. What about the difference of uh, two functions? Well, antiderivative of u dx minus the antiderivative of v dx. And you just handle them separately. How about the product of two functions? Well, this is not the antiderivative of u dx times the antiderivative of v dx. Why not? Well, well, on the one hand, it turns out not to work. That's one reason. Um, and the other reason is something that we'll get into later. But I'll point out that this requires something that is basically the reverse of the product rule. What room do I have? Not much room. So this requires... what's called integration by parts. And in the book that we're using, I believe that is section 13.4. Let me double check. No, 13.3. This is 13.3. And this is basically the, the reverse of the product rule, which makes sense. It's a product, right? We'll just call it reverse product rule as well. But we're going to be skipping that section. Um, the reason for that is that the content of that section does not enable us to work any new kinds of application problems. All it really does is say, hey, now we can work harder problems where the it, it requires more steps. So there aren't new kinds of problems, so we're leaving it out. Uh, if you're going into finance or economics, maybe you should, on your own, read that section just to see what it is. There's a formula in there, um, but we're not going to spend time on it um, as a required part of the class. What about the quotient? What's the reverse of the quotient rule? Basically, it's the same thing. It requires integration by parts. So we're skipping both of those things. If uh, you need them for a later course, you can probably pick it up then. Again, if, you're, if your major is in econ or finance, maybe you should read this section on your own. And if you want to ask questions about it, you totally can do that. But um, we're not going to spend time in class. I'm not going to plan on spending time in class on it. How about a composite function, right? In, for a derivative, use the chain rule. So basically, we need to reverse the chain rule. So this is called integration by substitution. And that is 13.2. So that will be the next video. How about this one, a root function, right? And you might you might see right away what needs to happen to make this go. So when you have a, a, the square root of x, that can be rewritten as an exponent, right? One half power, not an exponential function, but a power function, right? X to the one half power. And then I just use the power rule for the antiderivative add one to the exponent, and then divide by that exponent. So I'll have x to the 3 halves power, because I added one, divided by 3 halves, plus c. And of course, when you divide by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So this is 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power, plus c. Okay. What's next? Okay, this one, ln of x. That's a function we dealt with. We know the derivative of ln of x, right? It's 1 over x. So what's the antiderivative of ln of x? Well, this um, requires integration by parts. 
which I'll just abbreviate. Integration by parts, which we are skipping because that's 13.3. I'll cut to the chase and I'll just tell you that this equals uh, x ln of x minus x plus c. So if you want, you can find the derivative of this using the product rule and, and so forth, and you'll get ln of x as a result. So that, that that's the result, but we won't go through integration by parts. So I'll just tell you here, uh, probably you won't need this for any required part of the course, but Again, if you're, going to e if you're going to econ or finance, you might want to memorize this. That might be helpful later. Okay, what's next? Okay, some examples. So this is one that, that probably should not be very difficult, but a lot of people will have some trouble with it because they look at the, the decimal exponent and think, oh man, what do I do? I don't know. But we just follow the power rule for antiderivatives. We add one to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So this is x to the 1.73 power over 1.73 plus c. That's it. You just follow the power rule for the antiderivative. And if you take this and, and apply the power rule for the derivative, you will get x to the 0.73 power. Okay, how about this one? So I have two functions here, 2x and e to the x. So what I'm going to start by doing is separating them. So antiderivative of 2x dx plus the antiderivative of e to the x dx. Okay. Now, this is one we've done already, so I know that this is x squared. And I'm not going to write plus c. I'll, I'll point out why in a moment. Plus, what's the antiderivative of e to the x? Well, that's one we, we talked about, so e to the x. Now, I'll put plus c at the end. If I wanted to say, oh, this one has a plus c and this one has a plus c, plus c is a sort of a placeholder. It's some number we don't know. Maybe it's 2, maybe it's 1,000. We don't know it yet. Uh, in some cases, we'll need to find out what c is. So if I were to have, um, so for example... If I were to say this, if I were to say, oh, this is um, x squared plus c1 plus e to the x plus c2, then when I combine like terms, these two guys will combine into one number, whatever they happen to be. Maybe they're 2 and 5, which means that this one is really 7. Um, I don't need to handle them separately. I can just sort of stick them together at the beginning. Well, beginning. Um when I first write C in there, when I find the antiderivative, just stick them together and worry about it numerically later. I don't have to have them separated like this. If you want to, you can, but there's probably no benefit to doing that. Okay, um, and I'll point out also that I really did not need to write the step out. I can look at 2x and think, oh, what's the antiderivative of that? Write it down. Then I can look at um, e to the x, think what's the antiderivative of that? And write it down. I don't need to write out this intermediate step here. I can, but I don't really need to. If the problem is complicated enough, I might want to, just so I don't miss anything, but I don't necessarily need to do that. What's next? Okay, this one's a little bit harder, and this is one that um, is going to lead into our, our next example, our, our next big example, where we'll do an application. So what would you start with? and get e to the 2x power. So probably pause the video, think about this. And you might think, well, if I start with, do I have room? I think I do. If I start with e to the 2x, and I find the derivative using the chain rule, I get e to the 2x times 2 because of the chain rule. Well, there's no extra 2 here. But if I put a 1 half in front, then that 2 won't be there. So 1 half e to the 2x is the antiderivative, plus c, of course. Okay. If you think about, well, what if I had a different number? What if I had something like um, e to the kx dx? That I have some number as a multiplier in the exponent. Well, then this will be 1 over k e to the kx plus c, because if you take this right-hand side and you find the derivative, okay, you're going to get 1 over k times e to the kx times k, because of the chain rule, plus 0, and these k's will cancel, and you'll get e to the kx, okay? So, and this works for any numerical multiplying your exponent. 
if you had something like this, e to the u of x power, some function, x squared or x plus 5 or, or whatever, dx. Well, this needs integration by substitution. which again, this is 13.2. So we're not there yet, but this formula we can use, okay? So we need to talk about the concept of an initial value problem and that along with uh, this formula here will allow us to do the, the example on the next page. So an initial value problem is a kind of um, problem in, in antiderivatives where you're given a function that describes uh, the rate of change in something. This is like uh, maybe the speed or the growth rate. Oh, sales are going up every month by this amount or the, the, the speed of this vehicle is whatever. I should say velocity though. The velocity is whatever, some function. And you can use the antiderivative to work backwards to get information about what's happening with the thing. So if you say, okay, here's, here's a function that describes the rate of change in the value of this investment and you solve the initial value problem, you get the value of the investment as a function of time, not the rate of change, but the, the current value month to month, here's what it's worth in total. Okay. Um, another way of thinking about this is when you're doing diff derivatives and differentiation, you're looking at the rate of change. When you find the derivative, you're finding the rate of change of something, right? So you're looking for um, incremental small changes. When you do an anti-derivative, you are uh, accumulating those changes. Okay. This is sometimes called integral calculus because you're integrating, you're combining small values, uh, many small values into a larger value. That might not make a lot of sense yet, but it'll make more sense in a later section when we look at what does it mean to combine a bunch of small values. So let's say <clears throat> that you are given the value of some entity as a function of time is V of T equals 2000 E to the 0 0.5 T power. It's an exponential growth model, right? So that means that the, the, the value starts at 2,000 and it grows over time. Well, you can graph the derivative and say, okay, I know that the derivative is then V prime of T equals 100 E to the 0 0.5 T power. That means that the growth rate, the growth on per month starts out at like 100 and then it grows exponentially after that. And I didn't draw that very well. Let's try one more. It grows exponentially after that, right? So the value starts at 2,000 and goes up the growth rate starts at, well, the, the rate is a percent, but the growth, say, month to month or year to year, starts at 100 and goes up from there, okay? What if you're given the growth rate is g of t equals something, some exponential function, right? It just looks like this. I don't need to pick numbers in this case, right? And you're asked to find the antiderivative and work backwards. Well, since I know that this shape produces that shape. Then since I, I have this for my growth rate, I know it must come from a particular shape. I, I know the curvature of what this came from. So I know that my value is going to be like this, or maybe like this, or like this, or like this, or maybe like this. But I, I don't know what the starting value was, so I don't know which of those it was. I know that from one, say, one month to the next, you go up by a certain amount. I know that, right? I know the, the rate of change from point to point. But I, I don't know where you started and then moved up to that change, right? I just know the height difference. But once I have an initial value, oh, you started out here at this value. Well, now I know that it's actually this one that I actually have because I know where I started from, okay? So that's that's what an initial value problem is. You're given the growth rate and you work backwards through an antiderivative, but you need to also know, well, what was the starting value? What was the height in the graph? So let's do an example of that. So this is a problem that I wrote um, I believe it was early January 2012, I went to the Census Bureau's website and I looked at some of their data and I looked at, they had, you know, of course, the census goes every year and they count the number of people in the country and then they use this for demographics and apportionment and stuff like that. And 
I looked at their data on the change in the population from year to year because they, uh, you know, the Census Bureau doesn't do nothing for nine years and then, you know, suddenly, you know, fly into action for one year. They, they're doing stuff on a constant basis. So they're developing models. They are doing approximations every year, right? And so I looked at their data for the growth amount in the population from, from one year to the next. And I, I don't remember how far back the data went, but I just took all the data that they had. This, again, this is eight, eight and a half, nine years ago that I did this. So according to their data, they estimated that the population of the U.S. was 310,543,897 on January 1st, 2011. Okay, That's, of course, an estimate. Do they know that the last digit is seven? Well, while they were typing that up, someone was born or someone died. So no, that's not reliable, right? But the um, the 310 million, yeah, that's reliable. That's I'm sure that's correct. That they they know it well enough for that. The 543, uh, probably it's probably reliable, but the seven, not so much. Anyway, so I I used probably Excel, maybe something else, and I got this function that gives the change in the population from year to year is a function of time. So if you plug in one, that would correspond to 2011, and that would give the change in the population that year, okay? So by the end of the year, that'd be the amount of new people in the country, right? Um, you know, minus the, the ones that died or, or, or em, uh, emigrated, right? I think maybe emigrated when you leave, right? Anyway, so... P of T is in millions of people per year, just because I did not want to have a huge uh, coefficient here. I wanted this number to be small, not have a bunch of digits. Um, and this says, find a function that models the population at the beginning of each year. Use the model to predict the current population of the U.S. And, and this gives where I got the information from. So this is a rate of change, little p of T. So if I want to find what is the population as a function, big P of T, okay, that's going to be the antiderivative of little p of t dt. And then I can use the initial value to work out um, what c is essentially at the end. So this is going to be the antiderivative of 2.3508e to the 0 0.00763t power dt. And I'm going to use that formula that we got a moment ago, which I guess I'll copy here or re reproduce here. The antiderivative of e to the kt, well, I said x, didn't I? kx dx uh, is going to be uh, 1 over k e to the kx power plus c. But th the letter for the variable doesn't matter that much. It's, I'm just going to replace x, with, uh, replace x with t when I get down here. Okay, so this is going to be... Well, I could move the 2.3508 out in front since this is still relatively new. Maybe I should do that so that it matches the formula. Oops. There we go. So k equals 0 0.00763. So this is going to equal 2.3508 times 1 over k which is 0 0.00763 times e to that exponent, 0 0.00763. The exponent doesn't change at all, t, plus c. And of course, I can combine these into one fraction. So that will be, I've got four decimal places on top, five on bottom. So if I want to write this without decimals, this is 235080 over 763. Okay. E to the 0 0.00763 t power plus c. So that is my population as a function of time. But I don't know what c is. But that's where the initial value comes in. When t is 1, which corresponds to 2011, the population was 310 million. 543,897, which I'm writing this way because the function was in terms of millions of people. So 310 million in change would correspond to 310 point whatever. So if I plug in 1 for t, p of 1 will be 310.543897. So 
310.543897 equals 235080 over 763e to the 0.00763 times 1 power plus c. So I can subtract this guy on both sides so you can see by itself. So 310.543897 minus 235080 over 763e to the 0 0.00763 power equals c. So I'm going to throw that in a calculator. But I've done this problem enough. I just actually remember the result. This is 0. Uh, I believe 0 084499. Yeah, that's, that's the result you get for c. Don't be impressed. I just remember it from doing this before. So... P of t equals, there's my function, I'll just replace c in there, so 235080 over 763e to the 0 0.00763t power plus 0 0.084499. And you might think, are we really going to bother with this? Isn't that just going to get rounded off anyway? Remember, this is in millions of people. So this is almost 85,000 people. So this is not you know, a, a negligible amount. This is a significant amount. So there we go. This is the model, okay? Now, keep in mind, this is a model I made eight and a half, nine years ago using data from the time, right? So what I'm gonna do is right now, um, as the recording, this is November 2nd, 2020, okay? I'm going to work out what does this model say the population is right now. Now, for reasons that are obvious to anyone watching this, probably, um, this is not going to be accurate. Uh, so part of what we're going to be looking at is, is this accurate? Like, how close does this get? In past years, this model was an overestimate, um, but we'll see how it goes this time. It's a little, uh, what's the word I want? A little morbid, but this is the example I, I always use. So if if t equals 1 corresponds to 2011, in particular January, January 1st, 2011, right? Oh, t equals 1, sorry, t equals 1. Well, then t equals 2 would be 2012, right? t equals 3 would be 2013. So t equals 10 right? That would be 2020. And that would be January 1st, 2020. But this is November 2nd. This is almost 2021. We're, we're closing on 2021, right? So how many days have we gone through in... I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to cheat a little bit. What day of the year is it today? Today is day 307. Let's Let's just skip that. We're in day 307, so out of 365, or was it a leap year? Yep, 2020 is a leap year. So 10 plus this as a decimal, if we want, we don't have to turn it into a decimal, but I think we will. 10 plus 307 divided by 366. So this is approximately 10.83. 879781. I think that's what shouldn't we round that? Well, we can, but we're going to throw this in a calculator anyway. So might as well just do this. So P of 10.83879781. So this is going to be uh, 235080 over 763 times E to the 0. Point 0, 0, 0.00763 times 10.83879781 power plus we're going to have space here zero point zero eight four four nine nine. 
Okay, how much is that? Let me throw that in the calculator. So 235080 divided by 0.763 times E raised to the 0 0.00763 power time, well, 0 0.00763 times. And I'm going to just use have the calculator take the last answer because that's where the 10.8 and changes plus 0 084499. Okay. And I'm off by quite a bit. I have a mistake. Oh, that's why. Hold on. I had a, I accidentally had a decimal in there that should not have been there. Okay, two, three. Okay, so I get 334.747198. Now, this is in millions. So this corresponds to 334,747,198. Now, what I'm going to do, um, not, I'm going to pull up um, popclock.gov. Well, census.gov slash pop clock. Okay. And I get from their website that their current model says that their their estimate is three hundred thirty million five hundred thirty six nine forty. It's just rolling over a five. So this is within 4 million. This is pretty close. As a percent, how much, how off is that? So if I do this, if I subtract 330.536945, the difference is uh, 4, 210, 253. As a percent, how much is that? Well, if I... I divide by 330.536945. This is uh, off by 1.27%. percent. So it's pretty accurate. And, and remember, this function up here, I made around eight and a half, nine years ago on old data and it's almost within one percent accurate to today um and again it's a little, little bit morbid um given the current situation but but this is one of the benefits of this kind of model you can hopefully see that if you take data you can apply math to it and get information about patterns and what's going on and you can use partial data to predict the future, pretty much, right? Anyway, so that's that's antiderivatives. Uh, we'll be doing more in the next section. We only had a handful of examples. I think some of them are not that difficult. For example, the power um, the, the power rule for antiderivatives. If you really understand the power rule for the derivative, then the power rule for the antiderivative is not that much of a stretch. It's it's just reversing a thing that you already understand. Kind of like when you go to learn subtraction. If you understand addition, you've memorized the addition tables, uh, it's not that hard. Likewise for multiplication and so forth. So when you go to do antiderivatives, well, how strong are your derivatives? And if they are, then you're going to be okay.